Welcome to Growing Up Beverly Hills. I'm Stacy, And I'm David. We grew up together in Beverly Hills in the 1980s. Forget what you've seen in the movies or TV shows. We have the real stories about real people growing up in Beverly Hills. Here's a little known fact for you. There aren't any talking chihuahuas. <laughs> Beverly Hills folk drop a lot of names of people and places. We just can't help it. Don't worry, we'll explain it all at the end of the interview in the Beverly Hills Breakdown. Enjoy, subscribe, and follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Whoa, watch out. You got your great music in my amazing food. No, you got your amazing food in my great live music. Hmm, I love it. Me too. There's only one place to get gourmet food with the best live music in town, and that's Vibrato Grill Jazz. It's owned by our friend Eden Alpert and her father, the great Herb Alpert. They make you feel like a star amongst the stars. You can now dine inside or out. There's live music Friday and Saturday nights, and they have an amazing Sunday brunch with live music too. They have a full bar with imaginative cocktails, beer, and wine. They are located at the Glen Center at the top of Beverly Glen. You can make your reservations at resi.com or directly at vibratogrilljazz.com. Tell them Growing Up Beverly Hills sent you. We'll see you there at Vibrato Grill. Yay! Stacy, we're back for part two of our conversation with Claudia Wells. She did so much before the age of 18, we didn't even get to Back to the Future. Yeah, starting at eight, she performed in operas, modeled, and acted in tons of TV shows and TV movies, including Family, Herbie the Love Bug, Fame, Babies Having Babies, and many more. We start part two talking about Back to the Future. Claudia opens up about some of the hard times she had as a child actress. Nobody her age should have been asked to take on some of the responsibilities that she did. It's inspiring to hear how fate and her faith have given her so much today as she's an amazing business owner and mother. As well as giving so much of her time to charity and to the fans of Back to the Future. Enjoy part two. Enjoy part two. So let's talk about how, of course, we got to Back to the Future. That was the first year after high school, and I convinced everyone that I didn't need to go to college because, and in fact, I was taking... UCLA extension courses. Okay. But I took writing from the inner self, uh, psychology, birth to age four. I mean, and Edie Gourmet was in my um, writing from the inner self class. <laughs> That's funny. That's great. They wanted me to play Blackie's girlfriend in General Hospital when John Stamos was Blackie. Yeah. And General Hospital was like super famous. Yep. And my agents wouldn't let me because I'd gotten a pilot rise and shine at the same time. And if you do nighttime, you don't do daytime at the time. That was the whole thing. And I was so mad at them because it would have been a two year job. Mm. And I was in the 10th grade and I'm like, I could have left high school. But if I had (laughs) done that, I would never have even had the opportunity to do back to the future. So in hindsight, everything's good. It's always meant to be. I almost, I screen tested for young Sherlock Holmes which was a um, like a Spielberg movie. Uh, then I screen tested for Gremlins. So when I screen tested, it was down to two or three girls. I never knew if it was two or if it was three. And Goonies, I screen tested for. So when I went in for Back to the Future, it was Fenton Feinberg casting, who had right. just not cast me in Gremlins, Goonies, and Young Sherlock Holmes. It was a Steven Spielberg project, and I'd just not been chosen for his others. I think he was the one in charge of the others, or it was Kathleen Kennedy. It was the same company. So I just did the best I could, but I presumed I wasn't going to get it because I didn't get any of their projects. And my audition scene was the uh, scene Leah Thompson does where she's drinking and she's smoking and she's in the car with Marty at the dance sequence in the parking lot. Yeah, That was my audition. And I walked into the room at Amblin And it was Steven Spielberg, Bob Zemeckis, Bob Gale, Neil Canton, Frank Kennedy, no, Frank Marshall, Kathleen Kennedy, Judy Taylor, and um, a cameraman. No pressure. No No pressure. pressure. (laughs) But for me, I'm like, ooh, my friends are here. Because I knew Fenton Feinberg really liked me because they almost cast me a gazillion times. 
but yeah. actually never did. Right. And I was so weird. I loved auditions because I really liked meeting people. <laughs> so to me, it's like, I'd rather sit here and interview you two because I'm so curious about everyone. Yeah. And, and that's fun for me. And, um, and the guy who was auditioning for Marty, it was his 11th callback. Oh, he had God. auditioned 10 times already on my first. Wow. And Steven Spielberg was so cool. There was a camera set up and he said, I can't be in this room with the cameraman because I need to be behind the camera. And wow. the ca- he goes to the, and the cameraman's like, really? And he goes, yeah, yeah, you got to go. And the cameraman's like, <laughs> okay. So the cameraman was, he was fired. <laughs> and then Steven Spielberg went behind the camera and we did the, uh, the scene and then he sent us outside to do it where he said, do it like a radio show, just your lines on top of each other, go outside and practice, come back when you're ready. So we went outside and practiced and then came back and the whole scene, the whole audition, I was in there like an hour and a half and Steven talked to me the whole time. I don't remember the guy really saying much of anything. Wow. And Steven would ask me these different questions and no one else spoke, just me and Steven. And he asked me questions like, do you have a boyfriend? I was like, no. And he, <laughs> have you? Not really. And then he said, do you smoke? And I was like, I can't tell you that. And he said, no, you, I'm asking you, do you smoke? And I said, I'll tell you if you promise on your word of honor, never to tell my mom. <laughs> I promise. I said, everybody, you guys can't tell my mom if I tell you. And they're all like, we won't say a word. And I said, okay, so yeah, I do. And he, Steven goes, do you have any cigarettes with you? And I'm like, yeah. Ooh. And he goes, I want you to smoke in the scene. Cause she's smoking. Yeah. And I want you to blow the smoke in his face. So he can't even breathe. Poor guy. Oh. So I'm smoking in the scene and blowing smoke in his face. And I found out years and years later that Steven Spielberg had one of the very first non-smoking offices. So I'm probably the only one ever <laughs> who smoked in Amblin. I love that. That's great, Claudia. And then at the end, he was so funny. He goes, oh, no, the camera's been rolling this whole time. And I was like, Steven, you can't show anybody Promise is a promise. Right? He's That's like, great. But now I'm like, where's that film? Because <laughs> they found my Labyrinth audition. Now I'm thinking. They got them all. All those screen tests are somewhere. Yeah. Wow. Now, after that time, you didn't know you had that job right away, right? You're so good. <laughs> no, it was. In fact, I was nervous that day for a commercial callback I had that afternoon. Because commercials were so hard to get. A pilot in a series Easy. every year. Episodics, I got every second or third one. I mean, right. um, yeah, episodic guest starring roles. But commercials, they're always like, she's too classic looking. People will look at her and not the product. and She doesn't look plain enough. And so I was really thinking about that afternoon's job, which I didn't get. And <laughs> I think I found out about Back to the Future after about three weeks. Wow. And they just called and said, you, you've, been, uh, you've been cast, you've been hired. And I'm like, Wow. What was that like? I was terrified. You were terrified. Terrified because I was so hard on myself as an actor and a human being. I mean, I was harder on myself than I could even actually say publicly. I was really tough on myself to the point of not feeling, you know, good enough to live uh, many times. I was that tough on myself. Yeah, it's hard. And um, which is why it helped me so much with Dean Jones talking about God and how he loves me no matter what. Yeah. All of that. I'm perfectly beautifully made. And but I was scared because first of all, I was excited about doing a Spielberg movie. Sure. I'd never done a movie before. I'd only done television. So in my brain, if I was terrible in television, it's over in an hour. Right. Mm-hmm. But forgetting about reruns and all that. Or it's over in 30 minutes. Right. But a movie, I'm thinking it's going to be on at noon, two, four, six, eight, and 10 every single day. If I'm bad, everyone's going to know it and they're going to keep knowing it. Yeah. So like the pressure of that was um, scary to me. When you're working with a Steven Spielberg, don't you have the confidence that like, well, he's not going to let me be bad. Right. And Rob Zemeckis. No, that never even occurred to me. Mm-hmm. And, and I should have known better because I went to the network so many times for shows. And I remember going to ABC 
and the director was walking me to where I was going to go in and see 20 suits to do my audition. And he said, Claudia, when you get to the point of going to the network, we all know you can do the part and we all know the other girl can do the part. It's just a matter of chemistry and mm -hmm. coloring. And so just walk in with joie de vivre and don't worry about the results. So I should have known if I was cast in a Spielberg film, it's because I did a better Jennifer Parker job, yeah. according to them, than any other Hollywood Jennifer Parker kid, in the world. Right? Yeah. But, yeah. It, you know, I was, I, I was really nervous about yeah. that aspect of it. And even after I ended up doing it, which I was so thrilled to get my part back, before it came out, and I knew, it, like, we filmed in, I think, like, February, and they were, they were editing while they were filming, February, April. It came out July 3rd because oh. Universal and Amblin decided to push it up from a Christmas movie to July because they thought it was so good. And so... They were right. And I know, and it was at the Avco for nine months. It's unbelievable. Westwood, which never happened back then. And I think it, two months, three months was the... the biggest but I said to my mom before it was coming out mom we got to move to Africa <laughs> why like, now you want to move to Africa I said I don't want to be around when the movie comes out in case I'm bad <laughs> we got to go to Africa you know how we are as kids yeah well it's probably tough getting such a big gig at being how old were you 19 like 18 18 19 you know like we're so young you're fresh out of high I mean it just must have been a lot a whirlwind. But for me, I was accustomed to doing big gigs because yeah. I starred in series since I was 14 and opera since I was eight. It's unbelievable. You were also foregoing college. So was there a pressure of like, hey, now I've got to make a living doing this? Yes. And also, I didn't realize until I was 18, I was the family um, provider. Hmm. My mom was a temporary paralegal when I wasn't working, but I didn't realize until I called my business managers and that's where all my money was. Yeah. Uh -huh. And there wasn't any. So all those years, most I was supporting, you were, you were supporting, supporting your mom and you. Yeah. Basically. But I didn't know it. And um, it's okay in hindsight yeah. because my mom dedicated her life to my being yeah. able to have my dream. Yep. So, but I would have liked to have known it. Yeah. yeah. No, it's it's typical and classic. It's very funny because I was talking to someone about the Jackie Coogan law, about yeah. how you're supposed to have 30%, I think it's 30% saved for when the kid turns 18. Mm -hmm. And I called Keith Coogan and I was like, or I texted him one day and I go, Keith, the Coogan law, is that your grandfather? And he's like, yeah. And I was like, who knew? <laughs> Claudia, when was that enacted? When he was a famous kid in black and white movies and ended up uh, being broke, even though he made so much money, they set a Screen Actors Guild law, the Jackie Coogan law, that 30%, it's at least 30% of the income has to be set aside in a trust fund until the kid's 18. But no one checks on it. Right. Mm. That's still happening today. Oh, yeah. I mean, my my... Agent got 10%. My mom got 15% as my manager. Lawyer got 5%, entertainment oh. attorney. Business managers got 5%. So someone could have like enacted that and no one, yeah. they don't look out for, but you know what? Some of the, some of the kids, I, their parents bought property and land yeah. and homes and, and different things. So some, some of them, it worked out. Did you wow. feel like you and your mother were a team in this together because she's taking you to the auditions and being your manager? I felt like we were an absolute team. And we also were so enmeshed. And my success was her success. Mm -hmm. And my career became her world and yeah. dreams that it almost took away from it being my passion and desire because it became so much about it, it it became more of a pressurized kind of um rent is due yeah yeah, yeah. so you could feel that at some yeah. point very much so yeah mm -hmm. very very much so like how did you work through that like where did you grow from that with your i internalized it i am totally in i i've always said you never know what happens behind closed doors. Right. So whatever it looks like on the outside, you don't under, you 
do not know, nor can you guess what happens behind closed doors based on my own experience. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Because when I left the house, it was like everything was good and everything was perfect, but it was a very, very difficult time. And um, my mother was incredibly supportive of my career and -hmm. following my dreams and also extremely um, judgmental, Mm -hmm. which caused me to be extremely judgmental of myself. Yep. You know, I was too fat. I was... You know, to this, I was to that. I was, um, and I look at pictures and I'm like, I wasn't fat. You, you were not fat. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, it was a lot of pressure. Was your dad kind of a balance for that? You would think so. And mm-hmm. my dad is this amazing, kind man who I now uh, am know. But in high school, out of loyalty to my mom when we moved to LA Mm -hmm. I had a different last name starting in the seventh grade Mm -hmm. I had one week to decide on what my last name was going to be because family credits were going to be up and they're like what's her last name going to be and so my mom and I are driving around town naming street signs and Wells Fargo Claudia Wells I like the sound of that that's how I became Claudia Wells it's not my dad's last name Mm -hmm. so when we moved to LA she got an answering service and she got a mailing address. My dad wasn't allowed to know where I lived or what my oh. phone number or anything. So out of my personal loyalty to my mom, I had very little contact with my dad. Mm. I saw yeah. him at his father's funeral. I saw him once. And then he came to my high school graduation. And mm. that was like a, a warped loyalty to my mom based on They just had a really bad divorce. And I used to think they must have been so in love with each other to be so mad at each other for so long. And um, I, my dad would have been a very good catch all. In fact, when I was 12, he said, Claudia, let me handle your finances. I know you're starting to do acting now, but I'd rather not go to groceries or Mm -hmm. pay the bills. And I went home and I told my mom that, and she was so infuriated. Mm. Yeah, and he was right because my dad, my my father's family is very good with money and you know stocks and bonds and yep. how to you know they're old San Franciscans. Yeah, and um, my mother, you know, didn't. Wow. So so um, so there was a lot of hard stuff that I was dealing with, but nobody knew about. Right. Yeah. And um, and then. It was way after all that that I got to know my dad and and um, became friends with his wife, who's I, I call them my parents now, and I mean, they'll nice. they'll been married fifty years in June. Mm-hmm. Wow, that's yeah, incredible. I was five when they got married. Wow, and I still, if I look back, because my sister and brother ended up going to my dad's, right, which was a betrayal to my mom. It was really, right. it was just the way it was, and yeah. I stayed loyal to my mom. I saw how hurt she was and I wanted to make up for the love she wasn't getting from my siblings. And I took it upon myself to be that comfort and compassion and, and, and family to her and vice versa. Mm -hmm. So, so in other words, yes, we were a team, but also um, there was a lot of difficulty in it. Like um, people, my mom's friends would say, let her breathe, give her some freedom give her some air, let her, you know, have her own thoughts. Yeah. And her. it was like, it was a little glommed on. Gotcha. Um, it took, yeah. It took me a while to, yeah. But, but if I was to choose, I would still choose the, the path it went on. Right. I absolutely would. And I love that I'm my dad's DNA and my mom's DNA yeah. because they are such, the, the nice thing they each said about each other was, well, your father, he's brilliant. And my yeah. dad would say, well, your mother, she's brilliant. Yeah. So I'm like, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> you got a good mix of both. Yeah. You got double brilliant. I got double brilliant. And my son is a genius. And he used to say, well, mom, it skips a generation, didn't it? <laughs> <laughs> he was like the 99th percentile of every single test. Always. Oh, that's great. Or 99.8. Yeah, it was, it was a lot harder than I portrayed it to be. Sure. However, my mother was a go-getter and very strong. And she started her own business 
you know, to support us in San Francisco, knowing having not had a business. And I started my own business, having not had a business. Right. And, you know, my son has started his own businesses. So we're hustlers. The hustlers. That's great. So, so after Back to the Future and before you did, before you were signed on to do uh, episodes two and three, is that correct? Those were your roles? I wasn't signed on because at the time we did the movie, I didn't know there was going to be sequels and they say they didn't know either. Okay. Um, but at the end of the movie, at the screening, my mother went, there's going to be a sequel. Because okay. we fly off to the future together sure. and check on our kids. And it's, yeah. I, I don't remember if it said to be continued, but I right. think it did. Yeah, I think and so. I think so. So we, so we had a feeling. And then I found an email from Bob Gale. No, excuse me, a letter. Yeah, a typed letter from Bob Gale that said, "Keep uh, these pictures in case we need them for the sequels." Gotcha. Yeah. And I'm and I I mean I found it. I was going through all my old stuff, and I, we had an auction uh, a couple months ago. This celebrity auction, so I could help donate money to my charity and and different things. But um, I didn't donate that um, or auction that off. So they knew, and he did also tell me Claudia. In the in the next movie, your parts can be really big because it's going to be you and and Michael going through everything. Yeah, I was like, mm, that's cool. But I didn't realize that life would get turned upside down in such a dramatic right, way. Right, which is what I was going to ask right. you about. So your mom got sick, and that changed your yeah. life. Completely changed the trajectory. It was such a hard time because um, I I felt responsible because she she said to me, you know, she had lumps right here. And she used to say, look at these lumps. What do you think these lumps are? And I said, well, we should go to the doctor and find out. And she never did. Mm. And then a few years later, she was diagnosed with breast cancer on a Friday. Mm. And they did a lumpectomy on a Monday, wow. Cedar sinai Wow. And then they came out of the uh, operating room and talked to me. And Leona Mitchell was there, my mom's best friend, and said, we've discovered that she has fourth stage lymphoma oh. when we opened her up. Wow. And, um, and my, actually they kind of wondered, my mom wondered if it was maybe even just a floating lymph node that made them think she had breast cancer, right? But because they did a lumpectomy, she had to have six weeks of radiation and everything that could have gone wrong always did. Mm -hmm. Oh, nobody gets burned, but your mother's burned. Oh, right. nobody did it, but your mother did it. And it was such a weird dichotomy. I would take her and um, then get in trouble for eating the Oreos and graham crackers in the waiting room. Oh. <laughs> you can't I mean, win. <laughs> you can't win, right? <laughs> I can't get fat. Don't get and, fat now. <laughs> right. And it just was the, um, in her mind, she thought I gave her cancer from, you know, the stress I caused. Mm -hmm. And as a kid, I didn't know that that's not possible. Correct. Mm. Um, so it was a very hard time and I wanted to fix it. And yeah. I couldn't. And I remember I went in a panic to Norman Cousins' office because I knew he healed himself from the degenerative spinal disease. Right. And I, I called him and he said, come on by, went to his office. And I was just, I was so terrorized. I didn't know what to do because my mom did take charge of so much right. in our yeah. lives. And I didn't know, you know, how to pay the bills or right. how to run a household or anything because she did it. Right. So I was like, how am I going to, I don't know how to do this. Nobody knows how to do it at that age. And you had that pressure. Yeah. I thought I should have known how to do it. And cause I think I was, I was 19. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was 19 when she was diagnosed fully. I, I didn't know how to express what I needed to know. I mean, sure. he was like, feed her cabbage, feed her carrots, feed her, you know, um, that's all I remember. That's cancer fighting foods. So I'd be like, I'd buy a cabbage and a big thing of carrots. And I'd be like, now what? Do you know? It was just really hard. So you were caring for your mom. Yeah, I did the best I could. Yeah, I mean, I did that. I went to her with her to radiation and I didn't do as good a job as, as, uh, I, as she had hoped I would. I mean, I just, okay. I didn't know how to cook. You, were do you did the best that you could. I was so, yeah, it was scary. It was really scary. Oh, so and sorry. then, um, but she was very blessed. She had the best doctor at the Norris Cancer Institute at USC. And um, she was in the hospital for a really, really long time there. She used to 
uh, bribed the orderlies to go buy her cigarettes. And she yeah. had a corner room. Yeah, unbelievable. And, and I would visit her every day after work because I, I had had my store since I was 25. And I'd visit her. I was pregnant at 28. And she would wow. like watch my stomach grow. And I. Your mom got diagnosed at 19. I was 19. She, she died when I was seven and a half months pregnant. With your son. With my son. You opened your store in 1991. Yeah. Yeah. I was 25. I took care of my mom to the best of my ability. Eventually, she ended up going to my sister's. And okay. my sister and her husband at the time, this wonderful guy, Alan, they put up an apartment above their apartment with all my mom's furniture. And they took care of her the last several months. Wow. And a part of the time, my mom's other best friend, an opera singer, Carol Van S, took my mom on and they traveled the world together. My mom was like her assistant. Wow. When my mom went into remission at one point, mm. Placido Domingo's mom had pancreatic cancer. And was told she had six weeks to live. And they found someone in Mexico to give her these herbs. And two months later, she was in the audience watching him perform. Wow. So I called Plassi, his son, who I'm still friends with to this day. I'm still friends with all of them. I, I said, my mom needs whatever it is that your dad got for your mom. And they provided it. And my mom went into remission. Oh, my wow. God. That's amazing. At some, It was at one of those points. And when she was in remission is when she got to travel with Carol to Europe wow. and take care of the, you know, my mom was good at taking care of things and figuring things out and making things happen. And yeah. so she did that for Carol for months and had some of the greatest times of her life in the opera world, which she loved so much. Um, at, and then she, you know, went out of remission and, and it came back full force. So there was so there was a lot of in and out. Yeah. And the pressure of all of it really cracked me. Yeah. I just went out to left field and tried to find any which way I could to cope. And then yeah. my sister and her husband took over. Um, and at some point at 25, I opened my store because I want to go back to acting. I lived in other states. Oh, I you lived did. in Mexico for a while. I was engaged to a guy who... His father owned the national newspaper of Mexico, the Excelsior. Yeah. His brother was the CNN international newscaster. I speak <laughs> no Spanish. Give me French, no problem. I know. Let's go. Let's send you to right? France. And then I'm in a house with a billionaire Mexican family who like run the city and the country and um, didn't know him as well as I thought I did. <laughs> So I was all of a sudden I thought, you know, this guy could chop me up in little pieces. Yeah, and stick you me get in the fridge. They own the government and the police. No one will ever know. And so I left after about six weeks. <laughs> it really sounds like you took this break from acting because it was uh, a combination of things. It was just kind of all the work you had done, your mother getting sick, and then kind of an overwhelming response to having this pressure. That's exactly right. Yeah. I left my true loves Yeah, because mm -hmm. acting was my true love. I was seeing someone at the time that was like the first time I'd ever fallen in love, even though I was too shy to ever tell him. And um, yeah, it just was, I was handling things the best way I knew how, but I had no coping skills. No one had taught me how to, right. how to respond to tragedy. Yeah. yeah. Other than work. Yeah. Work was my freedom and yeah. my, my happy place, my, there was never, when I was working, I was completely fulfilled in every single way. And it's similar to when I'm dressing somewhere at my store. Now I am full. I, I love it so much. I'll forget to charge them. They're like, uh, we still have to pay. And I'm like, <laughs> Whoa, that's true. And, <laughs> I mean, I love it that much. So God is so incredibly kind that I get a career that I love as much I'm as fulfilled in my store when I'm actively dressing someone or doing a deal as I am when I'm acting. So how did the store come about? Yeah, they tell us about Armani Wells and how you got started. How did you get started in the men's business? I, I love that you picked men the angle of men. Me. They do. Well, when I was dating this guy, uh, my mom found gowns at a second at a resale shop called The Place and Company. And because I was going to dinner parties every you know, once yeah. a week and premieres. And I, with these major Beverly Hills 
I mean, you think our high school was major. These dinner parties were major, 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 major. Oh, yeah. Gregory Peck's house and or Jimmy Stewart. I mean, studio heads and these women and their big diamonds. And I'm wearing secondhand, you know, <laughs> dresses. I'll tell you something very funny. I know I keep jumping around, but it, it kind of. Oh, good. It's working. Um, OK, so I'm in the powder room, which is as big as the room I'm in now. Yeah. At one of the dinner parties. And I'm standing next to Candy Spelling. Okay. So some weekends, Candy Spelling and her husband were there. I mean, weeks. And then the other weeks, it was um, Leonard Goldberg and Wendy Goldberg because they had had that big fight. So they were never at the dinner party at the same time. Right. This is all the ends. They the had to take week. turns. They had to take turns. So Candy looked at me and she said, who designed your dress? And I said, uh, Nolan Miller. And she said, uh, no. I said, well, yeah. And she said, no, I designed that dress. Oh, boy. Where did you get it? And I said, my mother got it for me at this store she saw on TV that sells, resells stuff or used stuff. And she goes, yeah, that's my gown. Uh -oh. And I had it made for my, some da, da, da pearls. And she goes, she goes, I didn't know you were a size two. <laughs> <laughs> And I go, is that what size this is? And then she said, um, well, and I had a black one made for my da 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 jewelry. And I go, oh, I have the black one too. <laughs> <laughs> and then she said, I understand when I was first dating Aaron, I couldn't afford to buy beautiful clothes either for the, all of the functions we had. And had I known, I would have just given you my, my leftovers. <laughs> oh my God. I mean, seriously, when you buy a resale dress and you're actually standing next to the woman who designed it, oh at my God. the only time you've worn it. But anyway, that goes to years and years later, I had lived in New York for about six months and I was working for this lady just for fun, uh, who was a real, she owned a real estate company to rent out apartments to people. I, so it was interesting how God showed me how a woman runs her own business. Yeah. And she had this little walk up on 88th and Lex. And so I got to see and experience this. And um, it was so much fun. I lived at this other lady's house. And then I went back to, New to L.A. I'd been in New York for six months. I was supposed to be there for five days um, <laughs> to stay in Rockport at this house with five women, one of whom ended up hiring me, the other of whom I slept in her rollaway bed in her apartment and just never came back. Yeah, And then I came back six months later and I thought, I want to call my dad. I've already been gone so long. I should have a job before I call him. So he'll not be, you know, so he'll at least be pleased with me. Yeah. And I had bought a pair of earrings at this guy's resale shop in Studio City. And they had been in my purse for a long time. And I went back to return them because they were broken. And I wanted my money back and he wouldn't give it to me. And he wanted to give me store credit. He's like, well, my, I can't give you your money back. And I said, well, if you give me store credit, I'm going to lose it. And you'll have made my money twice. And he said, why don't you just buy something now? And I'm like, oh, that's a good idea. So I'm looking around and start <laughs> negotiating with him. And he says, oh, you're so good at negotiating. You should just work for me. And I said, well, I'm going to New York tomorrow. But I don't know, maybe another time. Okay. And so I got my shoes and I left. I come back six months later. I'm thinking that guy wanted to hire me. So I go to his resale shop and I said, hey, remember me? But of course I remember you, the <laughs> negotiator. I said, you told me you wanted me to work for you. I said, I can work for you. And he said, can you start tomorrow? And I was like, sure, <laughs> come here. I give you the keys and the password. And on the alarm is one, one, two, two pound. <laughs> <laughs> I hope he changed it for everybody listening. Uh, he's he's in, in Montreal now, so we're good. Okay. So he goes, he goes, um, and my password is not that on my alarm, by the good. way. No. He goes, can you start at 9 a.m.? And I'm like, sure. He goes, I'll be here at 2 o'clock. I go to the pool, to the terrace from noon to 2. <laughs> so I'll come back to that. I'm like, sure. Now, I've never worked at a store before. I've never seen this guy other than when I negotiated it, returning the broken earrings that were to totally my fault. Right. They've been in my purse for two months. And um, I, I mean, I never done anything, but I go into the store and it's like women came in and I just started dressing them and I write it up and take their money. And he ta taught me how to use the buttons on the, on the credit card machine. And I and his his monthly money he was making was like eight thousand, nine thousand a month. My first month I'm, I worked for him. He made fifteen thousand dollars. 
Oh. He was paying me $6 an hour and 4% commission. And my first check was $1,500. Oh, wow. hello. I brought my friends there in the middle of the night and tried to sell them the store <laughs> and put all the money in the register just because I knew 5% was mine. That's great. <laughs> hello. He would walk around the store and go, oh, oh, he's so funny. My girlfriend told me, not girlfriend, but, you know, best girlfriend, yeah. told me, um, Claudia, you know, he's never going to be able to fire you because you make him so much money. And I was like, oh, that's true. So I'd sit there with my feet up and talk <laughs> on the phone and he'd be like, you need to vacuum. And I'm like, I don't, I don't want to vacuum. Go, Move your butt. I said, I don't want to vacuum. And so he'd be vacuuming. <laughs> and I'd be watching him vacuum. And he would walk around the store and go, Mike, I wish there was something like this for men. And he was the most beautifully dressed man every day. French Moroccan. We used to speak a lot of French together. And oh, yeah. yeah. And um, I said, well, monsieur, I was calling monsieur. Why don't we open a store together for men? But he's uh -huh. French Moroccan. You don't, you don't have a business partner who's a woman. No. It's just not, it's just not their thing. And I, so I was real pushy about it. And he was, I, and I started pouting. Amy Grauman taught me how to pout. You cross your legs, you move your toe, you look at it, you go like this, move like this. <laughs> and, I and I would open a newspaper. These are like pro this. professional acting tips here for everybody out there. Right. I'm, I'm going to take that one. I wouldn't go get him the coffee or the croissant. I held a newspaper up. I don't even read the paper. And I just pouted for like four days. And finally, go, okay, okay, we open the <laughs> store together. Like, Thank you, monsieur. And my dad gave me $5,000. Oh, and wow. And he found a location around the corner from his store and he used to say we could take scooters and just go back and forth <laughs> <laughs> and i knew nothing 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 about men's clothing except how to choose a tie because at, we went to young man's fancy every father's day my mom and i so i could choose a tie to give to my dad that's all i knew that's i never grew great. up with a man my mm -hmm. brother left when he was 12 my you know i never lived with a man yeah. And knew nothing about it. But I know what I like and I know elegance and I know how men deserve to be treated. Between his ingenuity and my five grand, we opened a store. We got the key. Both of us had bad credit. Me from acting and other people handling my money. Him from being him. Yep. And I asked the landlord, I said, you don't want to run our, our credits because it's not good. Either one of us. Right. I said, but can you just give us a chance? He gave us a chance. Wow. Gave me the key. He's still my landlord 29 years later. Wow. And I give him a hug and a kiss on the 15th of every month. And it's my pleasure to pay the rent. And he's the best. So we opened the store and I was there the whole time. I had a knack for dressing men. It, I never knew. And then I have a knack for negotiating. And I'm negotiating with these people that used to be in charge of hiring me. Like major guys would walk in the store. But I yeah. never even told anyone I was an actress. I was Claudia Wells, Armani Wells, store owner. Right. But I didn't know what I was doing. So I'd call Monsieur and I'd speak in French. He goes, what do you want me to say? And I would say in French, tell me I can't charge this price. I have to charge higher. <laughs> 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 so it was like good cop, bad cop. Right. And we had very different attitudes about how to run a business in terms of, you know, business styles. Right. I wanted it to be like an Italian Rodeo Drive boutique that just happened to be resale. Yeah. And he liked to stuff it. And I wanted everything dry clean. And he wanted, oh, you just hang it up and it just hangs and the wrinkles come Voila. off. Like those. <laughs> <laughs> so I would do what I wanted to do. And I was always there and he was always with the women's store. And I annoyed him so much because I'd go, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh -huh. do anything. I, and then I'd do what I want. And so finally, after six months, I was like, monsieur, I bug you so much and I don't do anything you say. Why don't I just buy you out? Mm -hmm. Perfect. Well, my darling, that's such a good idea. So we worked out like 350 a week until Perfect. it was paid off. And I never remembered. I never kept track and neither did him. So like two years later, I'm still paying him every week. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm grateful to him. I mean, I he it, that oh, yeah. store has changed my life. Another act of fate in your life. You know, I, it seems exactly. like Back to the Future was so faded and so was this. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Had I not walked into that man's store and 29 years later, that store still, it supports me. It's such a hit with men. Men are so loyal. I, yeah. and, and I have such a, a, a need to show men that their birthright is dignity. 
and that men are powerful and men are, there's a certain way that they deserve to be treated because they're men. I'm about men are men and women are women in terms of how they deserve to be and that we each have our own, you know, birthrights. Yeah. Whether you're gay or straight or whatever, a man's birthrights are dignity and, Mm -hmm. you know, strength and power. And I show them how they deserve to be treated. But you've also shown women that you can be powerful and be a business owner. And yes, Yes. you're all all in one. You're one big package because you are not only an actress and you, you picked up your pieces, you've handled trauma, you've lived through faith, you've run a huge business for 29 years in retail. I'm, I'm a, I used to work in the garment center as a you did? on the wholesale side. And I truly understand what an accomplishment that is to have a thriving retail store for 29 years. So a lot of kudos to you. Thanks. It's yeah. the loyalty of, of the guys. Yeah, I'm going to write a book one day. I tell all of them, men are loyal. It's true. Isn't that true, David? <laughs> yes. Men are loyal to what they really, the hairdresser, their barber, their clothier, dry Easier cleaner. Than a guy. Yeah. Well, we hate to change. That's exactly <laughs> right. That's what they all say. But I mean, I dressed a guy and then he brought his son in when he was 12 and I dressed him. And the next time he came in was for his wedding oh. and I dressed him. Oh, and it's special. like these kind of things. I just, it's always a good time. I always learn something. And now my store is only open by appointment. That's amazing. Oh, mm-hmm. that you which can I love. Run your business that way. It's which a is fringe great. benefit of COVID. Yeah, yeah. Which is wonderful. What happened on the 25th anniversary of Back to the Future? How did this whole revampment of your whole career and this Comic Con and this whole thing, what happened at the 25th anniversary? I love your questions. You guys really, you know what you're doing so well. You do your research. Yeah, it's become this whole huge thing. Yeah, because a whole new career for you. Tell me about it. A whole new career for me. Yeah. I mean, in real life, an actual career for me. Yeah. I'm booked right now for Scotland, Orlando, Pensacola, Bailey, Tennessee, Knoxville, Tennessee, Vegas. Okay, what is this like? Because I don't even understand. Comic-Con, you're doing this. What is this fame like? Because these people are obsessed with you, right? Yeah, they taught me what it, um, this guy, um, Chris, taught me what super fan means. So now I call him Chris Superfan. He flies in to see me at my store. It's amazing. Tell us about it. Well, okay, so I went to the 25th anniversary. And in fact, that's where I met Goldie for the first time. Don Fullalove, who played Mayor Goldie Wilson in the movie. Yeah. And uh, I ended up dressing him like the following week. I've, I've gotten him from Ross Dress for Less to Armani <laughs> and Versace Love and Kenya and Prada. Nice. Love it's it. great. Um, yeah, I dress everybody. David, you're next. David, come in. I'm going to be a tough one because I don't like to get dressed at all. That's perfect. Maybe you need a new black t-shirt. Oh, I love to. It'll blow your mind. It's just an experience. <laughs> but right. um, So I started getting calls at my store do you want to go to this appearance? I'm doing a Back to the Future reunion at the Hollywood show. And do you want to go? Well, what's that? Well, you know, you bring pictures and people pay for you to sign them. And I, um, they pay for, you know, a picture with you. And I'm like, that's weird. Because <laughs> yeah. I never cared about autographs. To me, I could write someone's name down just as well as they could. I, yeah. I care about like their soul and relationships and, you know, either watching them from afar or when we meet getting to know someone even in my store people are superstars and I don't know it because it'll be 10 years later and I I never ask them what they do and someone else will walk in and go oh that's da 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 from the band da 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 and I'm like oh I know he plays the guitar you're like I know he's a size 42 (laughs) I know he's size 42 that's right that's right I know he likes Versace but um it's so funny so when did you start getting these calls? Was it the 25th? Yeah, it, it kind of started around the 25th anniversary. In fact, that's when everyone found out about Eric Stoltz having ever been Marty, because I thought no one was ever going to know that. But there was so much press. And then there was all those documentaries that I was in every documentary about right. the making thereof and all that. There's more even coming out. There's one coming out from that series, the movie that made us. It's a Netflix show. 
Oh, okay. yeah, 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 yeah. There's yeah. One, we already, there's one of those coming up. I started getting these calls and I did one of these shows and this guy came up to me and, and said, you know, I'd like to be your agent and show you how this goes. And I was like, okay. And so I had all these pictures made, Back to the Future pictures made, and I had the the big sign thing made. And, right. you know, I started doing shows and, and like, I remember sitting next to Lou Ferrigno and he was so interesting. We were talking so much that fans would actually have to go, um, uh, excuse me, can I? <laughs> and I just wasn't into it. I felt like I was, it was that insecurity again of why would you pay for this? Right. For yeah. me? I don't understand. And it felt like it was so personal. Like if you have a big line, it's like, whew. and if you don't, it's like, oh, what happened to me? And I, I didn't want to do it anymore. And the guy said, you've already ordered all these pictures. How about if we just do it till your pictures run out? I'm yeah. like, that okay. was years ago. I and mean, he's still <laughs> one of my agents. And I go, well, that makes sense. Cause you know, I'm pragmatic. I did pay for the pictures. And then I'm thinking, and then I start doing it and making great friends with the other actors and, you know, people on this side of the table. I saw what kind of joy came to people meeting me and wow. telling me their story of, you know, I saw Back to the Future with my dad before I found out he was going to divorce my mom. Or I saw Back to the Future on my first date with my now wife. I'm a, a rocket scientist because I, I, I saw Back to the Future and what, you know, Doc Brown did. There's, I, there's so many stories. I just got to watch the movies with my daughter. It's amazing, right? Did she like it? Oh, yeah. She loved them. <laughs> I fell in love with the ability to bring joy to people on yeah. such an easy, just being there and, and having an experience with someone who it's like, there's no stranger because you have something in common already, not necessarily just, I mean, some, there's a, when I went to Japan, there was like 25 or 30 Jennifer Parker dressed. Wow. Japanese wow. Girls. wow. Who, and, and two of them, cried and fell and I'm hugging them and they're sobbing mm. and we like oh, roll onto the ground together and I'm like I mean I it, the joy and the experience when I mean someone will put their arm around you and you can just feel their body you mm -hmm. know it or their face turns so sweet and it's like red because they're so excited wow. I know that feeling from when I like met Anne Margaret last week oh. because wow. for me when I meet people sure. who are iconic I, I grew up with people who are iconic. I, I mean, Placido and Luciano and all of those, that's like, they came to our house for pasta. So, right. but when I met Anne Margaret and I think there was one other person I met that I was like, oh, I get it now when you're yeah. meeting, like I met the girl who played Juliet in the movie Romeo and Juliet. And I just like kept staring at her and hearing that little giggle. And yeah, my favorite part about these shows is meeting people and, and, yeah. You know, I mean, I was in Australia and one of the handlers said, and oh, and I turned it into a business in my mind. Okay. So rather than selling a piece of myself, I'm selling property. I'm selling merchandise. It's pictures, it's clock tower flyers that I signed the back like I did in the movie. It's property. It's, mm -hmm. it's like selling a suit. Right. It's not personal. What's personal is the experience with the person. Yeah. But the money involved and the merchandise, to me, it's business. Like yeah. it's And how great to travel all over the world. I get to travel and I love to travel. So I'm paid to travel the world. Amazing. They cover the hotel. They cover the flight. They pay me to be there. And I get taken care of and treated so nice. And I get to meet new people. It's my dad traveled the world, lived in Africa for two and a half years, lived in Malaysia. You know, there's nowhere he hasn't traveled. Right. That I, I know of. I mean, he's the guy that knows every flower, every tree, every bird in the sky mm -hmm. and uh, from his travels. Yeah. So I get to travel and kiss kangaroos. Amazing. Again, you were up for all those other Spielberg films and you ended up in the biggest one out of all of those yeah. that you didn't get. I know. I think about that. I'm like, if I had gotten, I mean, Gremlins is big and Goonies is big, but they don't have the shows, right? <laughs> they don't travel the world doing these shows. It's like Star Trek. It's like there's Back to the Future and Trekkies. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I'm friends with the Star Trek people and the, um, no, what's that other one? Um, Star Wars. Yeah. I always get them confused. And when you're doing these shows and I'm like, 
you think someone's like famous for Star Wars and you're having lunch with them and then they tell you it's it's Star Trek. <laughs> or you think they're famous for Star Trek and it's no Claudia, it was Star Wars that the I other did. One. I'm like, oh, okay, okay. I love it. But um, I, love I it. meet these great people and these amazing artists. Oh, I know. When I was in Australia, um, they, they said, Claudia, there's someone that wants to talk to you. I go and the dad says, I'm the one who called you on the radio show yesterday after my 12 year old had called you. Mm. And I'm like, wow. He goes, I want you to come meet my son. And I said, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you, I'll tell you about her haircut another time. Okay. Definitely. I don't <laughs> want to know about the tail. We're having a cat <laughs> interlude here. <laughs> oh that's right it's a podcast okay so this child has a bone disease where his bones don't properly harden oh. they mm. stay soft so he's in a wheelchair which means holding a pen or doing anything like that is incredibly difficult for him yeah he wrote a letter that he wanted to read to me and he was there with his dad and his little brother and I meet him and I'm like of course I would love to hear your letter and he had spent like six months writing it or three oh months gosh. or four months writing it because he had to do so slow because his bones were soft. Oh. So he's reading this letter. His brother has tears coming down his eye. His father is tearing. And I'm listening to this beautiful letter of him telling me what he feels about me and why Back to the Future is so important to him. And then he says, can I give you a hug? And I'm like, of course. He got up and he walked the four steps and he said, just be careful. And he oh. gave me a hug and I, I gently hugged him. And his father said, for him to walk is so unusual and so mm. special and rare. I have chills. Don't you? Have, I have chills. It's so beautiful. So that's the joy and the blessing of doing these shows or doing charity events. Or I've done charity events where I didn't know that if someone was a man or a woman because he was so burned up from being in the war. Mm. and you see this smile coming out of a burnt face and a hug of one arm because that's all he had yeah. and I'm thinking if I can give joy to people yeah. just by being alive and and being human and having those interactions and it's fun and I travel and it makes me feel so happy yeah. to have you know that kind of a, a, a thing with people I, I'm so grateful. I can't even tell you. I'm so grateful. And it, you know, helps support me where my store, one of the reasons besides COVID that I'm, I'm keeping it open by appointment only is because then I can travel and not have people disappointed that I'm not at the store because exactly. I'm a one woman store. Yeah. I yeah. don't have employees and I want to be available to my customers because that's hugely important to me for the same reason. It's that relationship. Yeah. And taking care of people. I love taking care of people. Look at me with my three kitty cats. <laughs> Babysitting since I was seven. And then also you were prize your role as Jennifer Parker as well on Back to the Future video game. What was that like? That started from the um, 25th anniversary. Oh. I knew You're it. so good, Stacey. You should do this for a living. Well. <laughs> well. So. I'm leaving. I was like one of the last people to leave because I'm hugging everyone and talking to everyone. And I hear this, Jennifer, Jennifer. And, and it's funny because my sister's name is Jennifer. Mm. So other than responding because it's my character's name, yeah. I'm used to my mom forgetting our names when we were little and calling <laughs> me Jennifer and realizing, no, you're Claudia. And I hear this, Jennifer, Jennifer, Claudia, I mean, Claudia. And I turn around, it's this skinny little guy. And I'm like, hi, how are you? And he says, my name's AJ. I'm going to be Marty. I said, you're going to be Marty? Because, yeah, they're doing a, a video, a cartoon video or a video game of a Back to the Future. I'm going to be Marty. I said, really? I want to be Jennifer. He goes, you do? I said, of course I do. <laughs> I said, will you tell them? And he goes, sure. I said, promise? And again, eye to eye, shake, yep. it, shake on it. You promise? I get a phone call two days later. Oh, oh my this God. is the producer of the Telltale Games of uh, Back to the Future. And we're told you want to be Jennifer Parker. I'm like, of course I do. I am Jennifer Parker. <laughs> and they said, well, we were so happy to hear that. We thought you, you were too busy to even approach. And I'm like, <laughs> no, no. That's great. So, That's awesome. Is it, Christopher Lloyd and I are the only two original movie characters that really did, that weren't just a voiceover actors pretending to be us. 
fabulous. So they did this whole fun video of AJ coming to my store and saying, you got to come, you got to come do the video and grabbing me and pulling me. <laughs> and then we ended up doing the, the video games. Voiceover acting is something, by the way, I would like to do more of. Yeah. To anyone out there listening, I, I want that to be another one of my careers. I figured doing the voiceover of Jennifer in the video game, would have, would, I'd be set. Yeah. Um, but I suppose you have to pursue it at the same time. <laughs> I just figured <laughs> my phone would start ringing. Well, <laughs> well, we learned there's special agents for that on our show. We had Mindy Cohen on and she, you know, was a voiceover for Velma. On Scooby-Doo. You're kidding. Yeah. And she said she had to get a special voiceover agent to, agent. Get, to get into that. Def- I definitely want to do that. And I, I would love to do that. Oh, you'd be great at it. I'm so, I'm so dorky because my store takes so much of my life. I prayed to God to bring acting back to me, but bring it to me, like to yeah. my store and wrapped up all pretty with a nice bow. Mm-hmm. And it's funny because that's how all the acting roles have happened so far. Not great. That they've just been, you know, would you play the queen in this movie? And did it, which I'm going to film in Prague this summer. I was just going to ask you, how are cool. you traveling this month to go film a movie? Do you want to tell I was us supposed about what you're to. doing? Oh, what yeah, happened? I was supposed to go to Prague and I'm playing the queen in a fairy tale film, which I got an email a year ago asking me if I would do. And it was like a week after I decided in my brain, I, I really need to go back to acting and that passion is still there. And I've not even touched fulfilling my dreams of what kind of acting I want to do Yeah, um, in terms of roles and work. And I've lived so much life now. I don't have mm-hmm. to like make it up. I can just go based on experience. Exactly. Most anything. So um, except being a wife, that'll make up. <laughs> <laughs> and a week later, I get this offer to do this woman's movie and play the queen in a fairy tale movie. How fun. Well, we're excited. That sounds amazing. That's awesome, Claudia. Stays. So Claudia, looking back on it all, how would you, would you recommend child acting or in, would you recommend it to yourself and to others? I would recommend it to myself. Mm-hmm. My answer is if it's your passion and if it's what you have to do and you have such a dream to do it, it's because God gave that to you. And when he pricks that passion in your heart, it's because he's already aligned and set up what's going to happen. I mean, a part is yours or a part isn't. Unless something goes really cockeyed, like yeah. having the flu when you meet with Jim Henson for Labyrinth. <laughs> <laughs> but <Right>. even still <laughs> that part belonged to Jennifer and she was yeah. meant to do that. Like I was meant to do Jennifer and back to the future, no matter what. Right. So if you, if it's your dream, not someone else's. And if it's, if you can't think of anything else that is your dream besides that, be an actor, because yeah. there's a lot of, I used to say you have to thrive on rejection. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, you know, everyone's like, well, it's not personal, but it's completely personal. Sure. You're too tall. You're too short. You're too white. You're too dark. You're too fat. You're too thin. You're too yeah. nice. You know, it's, it's all, it's all personal. So yeah. you have to have a, so- a strong sense of, it took me years and years and years to get a sense that if I'm not starring in something, I'm still good enough to live. Like I'm still okay. Yeah. yeah. I'm still like worthy of waking up. I really, I I valued myself based on what jobs I got and and what money I made. I I knew that if someone said, how are you? If I could say, I'm great. I just started. I'm great. I'm about to star in. Mm -hmm. But to say I'm an A student or I'm a good friend to my friends or I'm a good babysitter wasn't enough for me to feel valuable. So it's taken me all this time to know that I'm valuable because God says so. That's right. Period. Whether everyone likes me or no one likes me, God says I'm valuable and I need to just trust that and have faith and believe that whether I have proof of it or I don't have proof of it, it's the facts. It's the truth. So if you can have a basis of self love and acceptance and you want to be an actor, be an actor. But if you need that to feel worthy of life, I highly recommend finding your value in first well i mean all of the god made all of us and he says all of us are beautifully and fearfully and wonderfully made and we're made peculiar 
however it is each of us i'm a everyone says to me you are one of a kind i've never met anyone like you i have a very you know silly sense of humor and i'm a combination of very serious and very flighty high you know lightweight but all of us are made in a special special way and we're yeah. each made with gifts so if your gift is to be an actor that's because you're supposed to be yeah and and if your gift is you know my son's gift is science math genius head was he ever interested in any acting well you know my son acted in a, a musical in high school because he knew it would look good on his college application yeah he won the science fair every year and did the science fair and, and ran for student president and all that stuff be his head was always about what's going to look good on my college application mm -hmm. right he was always thinking ahead and calculating his moves so when he was a baby he was such a gerber looking baby i mean not just because he's mine <laughs> he was the cutest baby on this planet yeah i mean he was just like a cherub if you put wings on his naked little back you yeah. have a cherub so that's cute. how he looked with this frizzy funny darling hair that stuck straight up Aww. and i didn't want him to get his value out of whether he was working or not yeah, yeah. That's so funny. We went to, I did a DeLorean car show, which was one of my very first ever things that had to do with Back to the Future. And Sebastian was nine. And we did a Q&A with Bob Gale. He was there also. And one of the people, the DeLorean owner said to my son, well, I have a question for her son. And, and he said, what was it like to see your mom in Back to the Future? How did you feel watching it? And he's like, oh, I don't know. I never saw it. <laughs> <laughs> They looked at me like I was this like horrible mom, um, <laughs> and he saw it after that because they yeah. all gave it him, you know, video of it. But he's never seen me in anything else hmm. ever, and mm -hmm. I, I had, I have boxes of you know stuff, stuff or yeah. But it never occurred to me, son, sit down and watch mommy on television. Or yeah, gonna have her movie night. True. Business is what he saw me as. Yeah, he was a little boy. He cried one day, and I said, "Why are you crying?" And he said, "Because I really want to work when I grow up and make money when I grow up." And I said, "Well, honey, you will, and you can." Yeah. And he goes, "No, only women work." <laughs> <laughs> You're like, he goes, they? "Mommy, men shop and women work." I'm like, "Actually, no, that's just a mommy's store. It's mommy, <laughs> men work. Yeah. Mommy flip that and around. Sometimes women work." <laughs> yeah, I love that. That's yeah, great. so he grew up just seeing mommy as a businesswoman. You were a single mom, is that correct? Sounds From pregnancy. Sounds like you raised an incredible young man. Sounds very you, smart yeah. and doing great and incredible. So you have a lot to be proud of, Claudia. And like you, you said, so Absolutely. I like what you said about acting and I love how you're so grateful for everything and how you're in the right place at the right time and that you are, everything is provided for. And, you know, your journey has been a journey for sure. But for sure, you're sitting here, you know, talking to us as such a beautiful, strong, confident woman that it's just incredible to see your journey and, and have you tell us all about it. It's been incredible. It's inspiring. Inspiring and everything, Claudia. It's just you guys amazing. are so great. Thank you. I can express myself a lot better when I write poetry. That's how oh, I kind of get. And you're a poet. <laughs> <laughs> so much. So much. Well, I've got hundreds of poems. Hundreds. I, I don't know what to do with them. I have hundreds, like over 400 we'll poems. Have you back on? You could read to us some poetry. <laughs> we'll have a poetry podcast. A I was thinking of doing a poetry podcast. Like that'd be cool. Having a podcast. Yeah. Yeah. I think sure. our our conversation so long, you might be a two part series. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a bit of a talker. Oh, it's well, wonderful. I'm, wonderful. I'm gonna I'm gonna wrap it up by bringing it back to Beverly Hills and a corny setup. You get in the DeLorean. You go back to 1984, Beverly Hills. What do you do for that day? Yeah, if I went back to Beverly Hills in a DeLorean in 1984, I'd say one day I'll be popular, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> I've been in the future and I see it. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's awesome. I don't know what I would do. I don't know what I would do. I, I, I don't know. But I, I'm glad that I went to high school in Beverly Hills and I'm really glad to know you guys and I'm glad to have had those experiences 
and know that it's not what they say it is on TV or anywhere else. It's a lot different and it's given me a heart for teenagers like nobody's business. And I would love to keep in touch with you guys and other people that we were in high school with. Well, speaking of other people, we want to give a shout out to our sponsor, Vibrato Grill and Eden Alpert. Eden! That's my absolute number one favorite restaurant. In fact, I got a text from my friend yesterday saying we had so much fun at Vibrato's. Let's make plans to go back. Yeah, it's great. We might all have to do a Growing Up Beverly Hills podcast event at Vibrato to have brunch or something. Oh, let's totally do that. Yeah, that would be I great. Would love that yeah we love yeah. we love eden and we love abrado and it's a lot of fun for us it is and she is claudia we can't thank you enough this was such a fun conversation it sure was claudia love seeing you again and love talking to you i love seeing both of you so good to see you claudia we love having you on it's Mwah. good to see you too i love you guys goodbye everybody bye well, it's time for the Beverly Hills Breakdown. Oh, yes, it is, David. The Beverly Hills Breakdown. Well, since we already did one breakdown with Claudia, I don't have too much for this breakdown. That is true. But one thing that was funny that she talked about was that Candy Spelling, who's Aaron Spelling's wife, was in a feud with Leonard Goldberg's wife, Wendy Goldberg. Ooh. And it sounds like one of their TV shows, like Claudia said, they had to alternate going to parties. It was like real life dynasty and drama in Beverly Hills. And Claudia was a part of it. I guess Candy Spelling's real life was probably a lot like the shows that they made. Leonard Goldberg was Aaron Spelling's partner on a lot of the shows. Oh, yeah. So they must have had a hard time going to work the next day. I don't know. For sure. <laughs> a little close for comfort. I just got off the phone with my mother, and she had just listened to the first part of our talk. What'd she say? She was saying Tony Howard went to Beverly High, too. Oh, well, that is kind of thrilling. So yeah. that could be another potential guest for our show. So we'd love to have the great casting director, Tony Howard, on. Yeah, we definitely would. And then I want to remind you guys all, too, if if you want to find out more about Claudia Wells, you can see everything at her website, ClaudiaWells.com. You can also head over to ArmaniWells.com, which is the website for her clothing store. You can book appointments directly with Claudia Wells, and she's a personal stylist. Her store, Armani Wells, is really amazing. Claudia is also involved in a charity called Kids in the Spotlight, which is empowering foster kids through filmmaking. You can reach that website at K-I-T-S-I-N-C dot org. K-I-T-S-I-N-C dot org. Kids in the Spotlight. All right. Well, that's it. Thank you so much, Claudia Wells. We had a great time. Can't wait to see you in person. We sure did, Claudia. We look forward to seeing you soon. And you are awesome. And thanks, everybody, for listening. Please like us. Talk to us on Instagram, Facebook, and subscribe. Keep on loving us. Talk to you soon. Bye. So suicide has personally affected my life. And we like to mention at the end of our show that there is help for everybody out there. You know, I think everybody's going through a tough time now. And we don't want anybody to take their lives. Especially during this COVID situation. Uh, we've all been experiencing depression and hard times. Things can always get better. Everything bad now can get better. Everything can get better, and there is a lot of help out there. So please reach out to the National Suicide Prevention Hotline at 1-800-273-8255. There is always help. It doesn't hurt to call, so do that. You don't have to do this alone. There's always help.